You did good. Is it a nice sunny day in Denver, Colorado today? Uh, it was a great day in Colorado. Even up in the mountains, we were up hiking them all day. Oh, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Carl, did you have yeah. any announcements to start with? Or? Nothing I can think of other than mentioning, uh, well, I can mention an hour at the end either way, but just the uh, monochrome competition in two weeks. Um, you know, obviously, you know, black and white is uh, is fully acceptable and preferred and needed and necessary, but um, I'd, I'd encourage people to also perhaps explore those old timey things like uh, sepia or cyanotype or, you know, monochrome just means a single color palette basically. Um, so it, it doesn't just have to be black and white or open other things. That's always fun. Yeah. Well, and actually, you know, if, if anybody wants to, you know, to do a sepia image or something like that, the color grading tools that are in Lightroom or Photoshop uh, certainly make it real easy to do. Yep. It's just a, a couple of clicks and bang, it's done. Yeah, that, that is right. I've created a platinum and albumin preset in uh, Lightroom using the color grading and the grain. Um, grain and clarity um looked at a zillion different uh photos of those two processes and uh kind of created a, my own preset for them so that was kind of fun to dabble in that well let me go ahead and introduce doug um oh great that's all right doug and carl yeah absolutely yeah okay. yep so uh, doug johnson is our presenter tonight uh, he'll be speaking on macro photography Doug is, uh, I guess, was a resident of Littleton uh, for many years, but um, I guess Littleton wasn't big enough, so he moved to Missoula, which has a much longer. <laughs> um, but for more than 20 years, he taught uh, people backcountry navigation skills, along with mountaineering, avalanche awareness, and wilderness first aid. And then after taking some courses and graduating from Rocky Mountain School of Photography, um, he plunged, I guess, uh, headlong or completely uh, yeah. <laughs> um, doing many diverse projects, including documentary, commercial, fine art, and uh, educational uh, projects. Assignments have taken him from coyote shooting with a camera in Wyoming uh, to the last stage of a woman's life to the graffiti covered alleys and abandoned buildings of Denver. He's currently involved in an ongoing project called Art Music, which fuses the art of photography with live musical performance. His educational philosophy is fun, intuitive and full of creative persistence. No matter where you are in your journey, Doug's balance of the aesthetic with the technical can help you further express uh, your unique vision. Uh, Doug currently uh, offers workshops through his company and uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about those this evening and continues to share his passion for photography, both the technical and the aesthetic uh, with his students uh, from around the country. Thank you. And thank you, Doug. For uh, offering to present tonight, and it's all yours. I'll, I'll put the computer on mute here. Hey, thank you, David, and I really appreciate you guys uh, giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I it's uh, it's what I've been doing my whole life is educating, and certainly uh -huh. this is is right in there. And um, you know, it's uh, um, my teaching style in almost all classes um, is basically just to. Be flexible and um, and open it up a little bit. So if anybody has any comments or questions, I, I encourage that. Um, so just chime in. And um, if it seems like that question might take us uh, take us down a long road, I might uh, uh, delay the the answer for a bit. But certainly that usually never happens. So so I encourage you guys to participate as well. And I know that macro is kind of one of those things that uh, some people have never done it. And uh, some people are very experienced and maybe even more experienced than I. Um, but uh, I love it. And um, so I've uh, put together this presentation, obviously, to to sort of try to uh, encompass the bounds of beginners to more advanced, maybe some new techniques that you'll learn or some some little workflow idea or equipment um, uh, piece that you might incorporate into your macro. So, um, so that's kind of how I'm going to run things, and I'll try. We'll try to take a break after an hour because that's what the doctor recommends, 
And uh, we'll just try to wrap this up in an hour and a half, something like that. So um, does that sound good, everybody? I think that sounds good. One thing, yeah, just one thing real quick before you jump in. I do yeah. see that we have uh, uh, one of our guests, Jenna, has joined us this evening. So I just want to take a second to say hi, Jenna. Uh, welcome hi, Jenna. You to, welcome you to uh, another meeting. Um, if I remember right, you were with us last week or, or last uh, the last meeting that we had. Yes, like, yes. If, Thanks for having yeah. me. All right, good. Excellent. All right. All right. Are you guys ready? Yes, if, if everybody will mute, please. And uh, Doug, it's off to you. Yeah, thank you very much. We, uh, we're gonna be talking about, generally talking about close-up photography because macro um, is a word that people associate with close-up, obviously, because you have to get really close. But uh, the macro uh, term is used for uh, a relationship in magnification between one thing and another. And we'll get into that a little bit, but generally we're just going to be talking about close-up photography. And I don't mean this kind of close-up um, because that's a little too close. Um, anyway, we're going to be talking about this kind of close-up photography. And, um, and we have to owe a little bit of history to this guy because this is the guy who basically is considered to be the father of macro photography. And that's uh, he was a biologist, uh, Frank Percy Smith. Um, and he took uh, photographs of very small things um, to for his uh, biology work, but that kind of started the whole the whole macro process in terms of the equipment for sure. Um, but certainly, we owe a lot of um, the techniques to him. Um, and this is just a couple shots of uh, Frank's um, biology work. Um, these look like little tadpoles, um, and uh, who knows what this is but I thought it was pretty cool. And certainly it's something very, very small. And I, I guess I wanted to, you know, after this little bit of history, I wanted to, to just show, um, uh, 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 occasionally the Guardian puts out uh, some beautiful, beautiful um, uh, portfolios of, uh, of things. And uh, a couple of years ago, they did a Garden Photography of the Year Award, the macro winners. And I'm just going to go through these because I thought they were so beautiful. Um, and certainly even me uh, uh, tries to uh, create this beauty in our macro um, in our macro photog photographs. But you'll find, probably find these really gorgeous as well. And I guess when you think about macro photography, one of the one of the biggest things is to think about the background. And if you'll notice in these in this series of photographs that the background is just um, mostly homogenous, but um, certainly very uh, informative and um, and supportive of the subject in terms of the color um, and or shape or all the other compositional elements, but just really, really beautiful. Well, we're going to be talking about backgrounds quite a bit in terms of relative distance between you, your object, and the background, and how to create something like this in terms of the softest background that you can create, and or to get everything sharp from corner to corner. And this gentleman or um, woman actually almost did that. How many people in the group, just a, just a question, um, have never shot close-up macro photography? Anybody in the group? Aren't those beautiful? And another thing we're gonna talk about is lighting. Um, certainly, with the in the macro world, you uh, you have the all the ability to control the light, um, and that usually doesn't happen in like when you're shooting landscape. Obviously, you have to wait for the light um, to be the way that you want it. But in the macro world, we can create it. And there's we're going to be talking about all different kinds of ways to modify light, um, you know, for your subject because light is the most one of the most powerful things in composition 
um, because it actually describes your subject um, in such a way, whether it's hard or soft um, and what angle the light is. That's a little thing called bokeh. But that man, is that pretty? And Shen Yun um, does some creative things with pins and then shoots them really close up, mimics uh, relationships between people. And uh, what a fun thing to play around with if you're, you're into creating the set, so to speak, of what you're going to shoot. Here's a little family. And Imgur, I don't know who, who that is, if that's his name or nickname, but he takes uh, little figures and then um, creates the scene. So a more close-up view of here, raisins being pumped up into grapes, which is pretty clever. No, Imgur is actually a website. It's not a person. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's a photo sharing site. Gotcha. But fun stuff that he's doing here with bread and the sesame seeds. All right, so we're going to talk, um, start this discussion basically about the equipment. Um, certainly, uh, macro tends it lends itself to different, a different technique maybe because once you get under high magnification, stability becomes one of the most important issues. And the higher magnification you get, the more you need to get things stable. So we're going to be talking about that um, in reference to the camera. Um, and its uh, relationship to the tripod and certainly lenses in their supplements. We're going to be discussing all of those things. So the camera, um, you know, what's uh, really important is that uh, 100, you see 100% of the view um, so that you know exactly what's in um, your scene because cropping in later um, is usually something we, we try not to do only because we want the, the largest file that we can. And if you don't have 100% view in your camera, um, live view does. All, and all cameras now have, you know, obviously the newer ones have live view. So you can turn, turn, in, turn on the live view and see 100% of the view. Um, depth of field preview button, that's not necessary as much anymore because live view can preview the depth of field now. But if you hold the older, older camera, then depth of field preview button is going to be your friend. And um, what's the downside of the depth of field preview button? Does anybody have a thought on that, old schoolers? Things get dark. Absolutely, things get dark. Um, and uh, Carl uh, said that right. When you are uh, stopping down to F22 or 16, boy, does it get dark. And then you have to do all kinds of techniques just to be able to see it. So that's why live view is so important. Um, to be able to preview the depth of field. Yeah, and in terms of metering, so now we have a histogram in live view. Um, and so we can see exactly what the exposure is going to be like. And so that's really handy too, so that you don't have to be so proficient in your metering, metering skills. Um, especially, especially if you have to move the camera around to, to meter with your spot meter, that becomes a a pain in the neck. Um, so live view, once again, with the histogram is a really important thing. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, with the DSLRs um, and uh, film cameras, you had to raise your mirror up to be able to uh, help with the stability um, so that the, you didn't get the slap of the mirror. And now in live view, you're, if you own a DSLR, your mirror is up when you're in li the live view mode. Um, so you don't have to worry about that vibration from the mirror anymore. Um, and mirrorless cameras don't even have a mirror, so you don't have to worry, worry about that so much. Um, and then another thing in terms of that uh, idea of stability is you're you know, either using your self-timer or a cable release so that you aren't touching the camera. Because just remember, um, when we get working under high magnification, just, the, just touching the camera will will you know, screw things up. So you want to be able to get your hands away from the camera and uh, using a timer or a cable release can help you do that. One thing about a self-timer though, um, that's not as an advantage as a cable release is 
the ear actually have to weight the the amount of the tire that's set on the timer and that might not, not be good for insects or you know in uh, uh, a, uh, a place where uh, something might be moving you know like a, a small little blade of grass or whatever it might be um, so cable release becomes um, you know really really important in that regard all right and in terms of the tripod I think there's three things that you want. You want it to be sturdy, um, like a bowl. Um, so a very sturdy tripod is going to be your friend. Um, fully adjustable down to the ground. Um, another really important feature on a tripod and easy to use so that you will use your tripod. So give me a hug, tripod. Um, so those three things I think are really important when it comes to thinking about a tripod. And, you know, uh, when we think about uh, that idea of fully adjustable down to the ground, um, here's a tripod where the center post is limiting the photographer's ability to move the camera as close to the ground as possible while still on the tripod. Um, so there's other ways you can get around that. You can remove some of the tripods. You can remove the center post um, completely so you don't have to use it again. Um, and that can be... Uh, that will get you down to the ground like this. So that you're gonna really, really want a tripod that does that. So many instances where you're gonna be that close to the ground. And some tripods have the uh, center post that comes out and then you can move it to the side um, and get pretty darn close to the ground that way. Just a little more works involved. And in terms of tripod heads, um, you know, I've used I've used all kinds of ball heads, and um, but what I really love when I go to do some macro work is a pan tilt head, and this is the the pan tilt head that I use, and it's geared. It's made by Monfrotto, um, and you can do micro movements with the uh, adjustments of the knobs. Whereas with the ball head, it always seems like it wants to settle in a place as it grips the ball that's not perfectly how you want it. And um, so I get frustrated using ball head for macro. So if you find yourself doing lots of macro work, you're gonna probably maybe wanna think about a, a pan tilt head. Um, but that's only if you don't use a, um, a, um, a focusing rail, because a focusing rail will allow you to go sideways and forward, forward and backward with little micro movements. So not quite as important um, on a ball head when you have a focusing rail on top of it. But still, I, I uh, my goal is to to get everything super stable, and I think the pan tilt geared head does does that a little bit better than a ball. And you know, I just I'm throwing in a couple macro shots just to loosen up the technical jargon that we're going through. Um, in this in the beginning here and this I can't remember the name of this flower but that's the stamen of the flower all right so let's uh now we talked a little bit about equipment let's talk about getting close and um there's lots of different ways to get closer to your subject with with your lenses and um, one of them is to purchase a macro lens and a macro lens what distinguishes a macro lens from all other lenses its ability to focus close enough so that your um, your subject is life size compared to the real subject. And that's where macro lens end is that you can't focus any closer than one to one magnification ratio or life size. So um, that's and a macro lens. They're fantastic. Um, and they all are probably the sharpest lens in your bag if you buy a macro lens, and uh, they're uh, fairly pricey um, for that reason. But a lot of lenses will say macro on the lens, but they're not truly macro lens that lenses. They actually just allow you to focus closer than you would normally would. But like I said, what distinguishes the macro lens is the one-to-one -one magnification ratio. And I'm gonna show you exactly what that means. Um, another really inexpensive way to get closer to your subject, and you can go get to one-to-one -one with a lot of different lenses using extension tubes, and you can go beyond one-to-one. -one. Um, so extension tubes are cheap, they have no glass, and uh, so they're uh, a great tool to use. And, 
anything that you you buy that uh, allows you to get closer, there's always some negative aspect to that. And I'll talk about those when we talk about these specific things like extension tubes or diopters, teleconverters. Um, they allow you to focus closer. Um, and so let's talk about the macro lens. Um, like I said, macro lenses all go to life size. That's one to one. The focal length makes a big difference, not only in terms of the angle of view, but the, the working distance changes when you change focal lengths. And there's no zoom macro lens. So all the macro lenses are fixed in terms of their uh, focal length. Um, and they're all very fast lenses. Macro lenses go to F2.8, all of them. So they're very fast. And sometimes you can consider a lens collar, which helps with stability, especially on some of the longer macro lenses. Um, a lens collar will be um, will be available to you on Canon. I know you have to buy the collar, um, but uh, and Nikon, they the lens the collar comes with the lens. So um, just something to consider, and uh, we'll we'll look at those specifics here in a just just a minute. Um, so the choices, budget, angle of view, and uh, and your close focus distance. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, if you don't want to purchase a, a lens that like a Canon lens for your uh, Canon camera, there's a lot of different companies that make um, third party lenses like Sigma and Tamron um, that are cheaper than the camera brand. Um, but, and they're just as good. So, uh, yeah, think about your budget and th think, think about uh, buying something other than, um, your camera brand, the angle of view. I'll talk about that and close focus distance. That's going to be the, um, important thing to consider when you're thinking about a macro lens, probably can't buy all three of the distances or the focal lengths, but, you know, certainly, uh, the pros and cons of, of, uh, you know, the angle view and the focus distance are important. So if we look at a wider or a normal, here's a normal macro lens at 50 to 60 millimeters. It doesn't come with a collar, obviously, um, because it's a short enough lens that you can mount the camera to the tripod just on, with the camera body on the, on the tripod. But the close focusing distance, this is what's important, is six inches at, at a one-to-one -one magnification ratio. So six inches. As we go longer, that focus distance is going to be longer too. Um, and so if we go to the 100 or 105, um, that range of focal length, um, here's a Canon camera that you can put a lens collar on. Um, but the more, most important thing is here now that close focusing distance has doubled to 12 inches at a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so what does that help with? Anybody have any thoughts about why it would be advantageous to have a, a a longer close focusing distance further away from the subject to get to one to one? Shooting pictures of bees. Yeah, absolutely. Taking pictures of insects. Um, and or rattlesnakes. Uh, rattlesnakes, of course, <laughs> or Kodiak, Kodiak bears. Um, no. Yeah, absolutely. Insects is one thing that, yeah, you can scare insects if you get too close. The other thing that I found, because I've never used a wider uh, wider macro lens, is that it helps with your tripod legs. When you start to work tripod legs into, a say, a field of dew, and you're trying to get to a spider web that has dew on it, um, if you're further away, uh, your tripod legs will not disturb the, the grass and all the things that are connected to that 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 spider web. So I like the I like the longer um, macro lenses, and uh, so I have a 105, and then I have a longer one. I have a 200 um, that I use, and because the 200 also gives you a further distance from the subject, so that's 18 inches on a 200 millimeter macro lens. So that's even better to move that much further away. So, uh, so something to consider if you're if, if you're buying a new macro lens is the is the um, is the focal length and the close focusing distance. And here's the collar on it, so you can see that it's mounted over the balance point of the lens, 
um, so that your camera and the lens are balanced, centered over the tripod, as opposed to the big lens hanging out um, over the uh, away from the the center axis of the tripod. So, um, so if, yeah, lens collar becomes pretty important for stability, and we're always thinking about stability when we're thinking about shooting close up. But here's here's an idea of the distance between the two. And so here's the here's the idea of life size so that the dime in real life here is the same size as the dime on this that you see on the sensor. And that is considered to be life size. And that's what all macro lenses go to is uh, their closest focus distance is one to one or life size. There's one other lens that I could mention, and that's 12 and 18 inches for those two, 100 and 200. Another lens that I uh, that's not discount or discontinued, so you can no longer buy it. At least I looked on B and H, and you can't buy this lens. But this is uh, this is a lens that starts at one to one, and it goes to five to one magnification ratio. It's extremely difficult to use at that uh, magnification because not only is your depth of field so narrow, but you breathe on the on the lens and the camera and it moves everything um, because you're so close up. So, um, but I know a friend just bought one and he found it on eBay and I, I think he got it for $250 and it's a beautiful lens. So if you want to go further than uh, macro one-to-one -one, um, and get into some really high magnification, then uh, look to the Canon MPE and it's the only manufacturer that does um, more Mag or higher magnification than five to one, or one to one, I mean, I'm sorry. Here's another, just a pretty macro picture. I'm not, I think that is at one to one mag magnification. But let's talk about magnification really quick. It's the ratio between physical sizes, like I showed you with the dime. Um, so close up is considered to be, you know, uh, you know, one tenth life size, one eighth, one quarter, one half. Those are all I consider to be close up shots of your subject. But macro, in terms of the definition, uh, macro starts at life size um, and goes up to, you know, four to one, somewhere in that range. And if you get anything greater than that, you're talking photomicrography, um, which um, then you need really special equipment to get, get into that kind of that kind of range. But let's look at what this means in real life. So if we look at a flower that I shot, I shot it at different magnifications. Um, here's one to eight life size. So you can see I'm pretty close to the flower, um, certainly. And I would consider this to be close-up photography. And here's a one sixth life size. We go to a quarter, we go to a half, and then we go to life size. So this is where a macro lens will get you. Just by the, the act of purchasing a macro lens, this is how close you can make, or how big you can make your subject, um, is right there. Let's talk about supplements. Um, extension tubes and diopters. So extension tubes, like I said, they're hollow. They normally come in a set. And uh, there's no glass in them. And usually the set in, includes a, a 12 millimeter uh, uh, width, 20 millimeters and 36 millimeters. And Velo, um, I think that price has changed. I think it's up to 100 and a little over $100 for the set. Um, but Velo is a brand, is a B&H brand. If you buy the Nikons or Canons, they're quite a bit more expensive. Um, and all they are is uh, a, a spacer that goes between um, your lens and the camera with all the connections for autofocus, um, being, being able to meter, read the meter, um, your meter will work and all that stuff. So buying a, a brand like Velo um, has a lot of uh, advantages um, for your pocketbook. Um, the disadvantage of uh, extension tubes um, is that the more extension you put on, the more light you lose. You can, you know, lose up to almost two stops of light just by using all the extension. 
think it's one and a half stops if you put all the extensions on. But here's how you would uh, calculate what the extension does for you in terms of, um, you know, a, say a 50 millimeter lens. So if we take the magnification ratio and it, that equals the extension length over the focal length. So if you want a half life size and you're using a 50 millimeter lens, then you'd put on 25 millimeters of extension and you'd get to the one half life size or one, one to two magnification ratio. So that's nice. The beauty of extension is you can use them on any lens. And I use them frequently on my 200 mil, my normal 200 millimeter lens um, to get just closer in terms of like the the closest distance without extension on is about six feet on a 200 millimeter lens. But if you start putting extension behind the, the lens, then you can get within three feet or two feet of your subject. And um, that's super good, super nice to be able to do that because then you're, you're way far away from your subject and you're still able to get closer. Um, and I even use... Um, the, the uh, extension tubes on my on my macro lens um, to get even closer. So I can go beyond one to one by putting ex, uh, extension on. The other downside to that is that you're, it, it pushes the, the lens further from your camera so that it's more imbalanced with the extension on. So once again, we're always talking about um, stability. So you have to make sure that everything is so stable when you start to add extension to things. It just makes you more aware of, um, of things that can move the camera. Um, so just a, another thought about extension. If you want to uh, get a one-to-one -one ratio with a uh, 50 millimeter lens, you put on 50 millimeters of extension. So this is nice. Because the reason I'm really stressing the extension tubes is you every most everybody has a 50 millimeter lens. It's a, it's just a common lens that most people have. And here, 50 millimeter lenses are relatively expensive. If you don't own a 50 millimeter lens, you can get them for a couple hundred bucks. And then if you buy the extension at $100, you can get into the macro world, basically, with just about you know, $350, something like that. So that's much cheaper than a macro lens. Um, and you have the added versatility of being able to use the extension on all your lenses. So just a, uh, it's a great tool to have in your bag um, for anybody that works close up. And then another thing about keeping things cheap if you haven't done much macro work is macro is a different world it requires lots of patience, and some people don't have that patience. I've had lots of students that have taken a macro class, and they, they're just like, this is not for me, um, because there's more gear involved. It's more tedious. You have to have more patience. All those things are important when you're, you're uh, working in macro. So, um, so that's why you know buying cheap at first is a good idea. And then if you want to, you know, buy more expensive uh, equipment like macro lens, um, then you, you know that you're going to be able to use that um, for its value for certain. So here's just a couple uh, 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 re relationships um, in terms of lenses and extension. So here's a 24 millimeter lens, wide angle. And here I put 24 millimeters of extension on it. So we get to one-to-one -to -one just by using a, a wide angle lens here, just by putting the extension behind the lens. Question from the peanut gallery. Ah, absolutely. I love peanuts. Um, uh, do you have to have a fixed focal length lens to use an extension tube? Can you use a zoom lens? Yes, you can. In fact, I put the extension behind my 70 to 200 all the time. So you can. Sometimes if you put too much extension on the behind the lens and you find this out very quickly, you can't focus on anything because the actual focal plane is inside the lens. So you can go you can go too much with the extension. 
Like if I was to put on this uh, uh, focal length of 24 millimeters, if I was to put 50 millimeters of extension on it, I would not be able to focus. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that out very quickly, but great question. That's a great question. Here's a, a, an example of 24 millimeter lens with 12 millimeters of extension. So I'm at a half life size. And here's my 105 millimeter macro at half life size. You can see the view, how different it is between the two shots. The wide angle lens is giving us a really nice wide view. And the 105 is actually giving us a more telephoto view. So, so yeah, you can get, you can compositionally work these things the way that you want them. And I, I actually like the one on the left. It, it includes more environment to support that little, little tiny pine cone. So here's an example of 200 millimeter. This is my 70 to 200 without extension. Um, so my focusing distance is four feet, six inches. And um, so that's the, uh, so I'm pretty far back there. But then if I put 36 millimeters, oh, I put them all on my 12, 20 and 36. So now my close focusing distance is one feet, eight inches. Look what happened to the vignetting though. Do you guys see that on the corners? Little black, uh, little black corners. That's because the extension um, is uh, just a little bit too much for the lens. Um, and I don't know the fix physics behind that, but um, certainly that's what I got when I used all the extension on my 200 millimeter lens. So if I didn't want that, uh, um, that uh, vignetting in the corners, I just take off the 12 there and I'd probably be okay. There's a fish, Seattle market. All right, any questions about extension tubes, anybody? How many people own them? Well, a couple of people here in, in uh, the meeting room. Oh, that's great. Do you love them? Yeah, there's a couple of people on Zoom are saying the same thing. A few people do own them. Oh, good. Yeah, for those people that don't, it'd be a worthwhile thing to ask for Christmas or your birthday because um, they aren't, aren't very expensive. People can afford them. Absolutely. But, and, you know, for those people who have not tried macro, it's a nice inexpensive way uh, to find out if they like it. You know, exactly, they can, they can Carl. Take, they can take the lens that they're using right now. Uh, stick the extension tube on there, give macro a shot. And if they really like it, then maybe invest in a macro lens later. Yep, so that's one exactly point, right. Point, yeah, one point I'd like to make about extension tubes, because I found this out myself when I used them, uh -huh. is when when you're extending the lens away from the camera body, the farther you go, um, you lose the ability to focus that lens at infinity or even maybe 20 feet or 30 feet. That's because exactly what, right. You're, yeah, because you're shifting the optic, optical capabilities of the lens. So when you're using an extension tube, all, I'll, all I will say is know that you're going to be shooting, you know, close stuff. Close up. And when you want to shoot other stuff, pull that extension tube off and go back to normal. Yeah, great point, Carl. Thank you. That's uh, awesome. I think you answered my question because I was going to ask what the difference was for extension tubes versus teleconverters, um, you know, for example, nature photography, and I think you've answered that question already. Yep, that's it. Uh, Good. Could, could I interject something here? Absolutely. Uh, you did mention uh, close-up filters. Uh, I have close-up filters. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and uh, close-up filters are another really inexpensive way to get close to stuff. Um, it's just just like putting a magnifying glass on on your the front of your lens. They're curved, um, and uh, and they're helpful. Um, you can kind of see, and they're cheap too. A whole set of four or three here, uh, one power, two and four, not only ninety bucks, and um, certainly you know that's helpful too. Um, the only downside to close up filters is that they're it's soft on the edges. In a world where you need to get everything sharp, they're probably not the best um, best choice. Um, but certainly, if you're in a field of flowers and uh, around the edges, you could care less if it's soft. Um, you know, they're a good good tool to use. But here's here's just a 
examples of uh, using the close-up filter. So this is as close as I could get with this lens. Uh, magnification ratio is 20, uh, 1 20th of life size. And then I put a number one on, which got me to 1 10th life size. A number two got me to 1 uh, one fifth life size. And then number four got me to a half life size. And you can see it's still pretty. Um, you know, the composition's pretty. Um, it's just, you know, soft around the edges. And I did a little test with these, these close-up filters and I on a, you know, a page from a book. And um, you can see that here's 105 macro with no filter at one to four or quarter life size. And you can see even on the corners, this is from the bridge. This is how it views things at the corner at 100%. Um, and you can see that it's pretty sharp. Um, even at, all the way down there at the corner of the frame. But if I put a number two filter on, uh, on the 105 at, at still fourth life size, you can see that it's pretty sharp in the, in the middle. But if you go to the a corner, you see what happens? It gets soft. And it also uh, adds more uh, chromatic aberration. You can see that there's a little blue and red in there on the corners. And so yeah, there's, that's the only downside to close-up filters is it gets soft on the edges, even though they do some really cool, cool things in terms of, you know, getting, being able to get close and producing really soft uh, corners, which might be helpful. So there's the two. You can see quite a bit of difference in the corner. I was trying to photograph something uh, with the macro lens and I couldn't get close enough or couldn't get it large enough. So I put a close-up filter on it and that did it. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah, that's the thing about uh think about macros. You you have to use use your brain and try to figure things out. Um, because we are working so close to our subject. And that's a that's a good answer to your problem right there. But here's you know, here's I use a close-up filter on this little buttercup, and um it's beautiful. Who cares that it's soft on the corners? I don't. Uh, dual element diopters, they used to be available. Um, uh, they're not available anymore, but you can probably find them used. And um, they have two pieces of glass, and it solved the, the problem with the single close-up filter. So it's much sharper. Um, but the, um, the only one that I found available to all of mankind um, these dual element diopters was a Canon and it was a 52 millimeter thread diameter. So pretty limited um, um, to be able to find those. Um, SLR Magic um, has a diopter too that they've created. It's a one uh, plus 1.8 and that's still available in a 77 millimeter uh, filter diameter and it's $130. So a pen, uh, expensive little piece of glass. I think the close-up filters, or I mean the extension tubes, are probably a better bet um, there. And you have to get a step-down ring if you need, if you want to use this filter with a different lens size step-down adapter. Teleconverters can help you get close too. So if you use a two times teleconverter. Um, on with a magnification ratio of one to half, one half life size, then that gets you to one to one. And so those are pretty pricey too. But if you have one to use normally to get make a lens longer um, and focus at infinity, then a tele, teleconverter is going to help you do that. And uh, yeah, I think they're around 300, 300 bucks, something like that. Is that right? Anybody that's purchased one recently? I think they're about 300. I haven't purchased one recently, but yes, they are in the hundreds of dollars, especially, you know, for the Nikon or, or Canon. And of yeah. Course, you know, those are used primarily with wildlife. 70, 70 to 200 of the wildlife lenses, the three, four, five hundreds and those kind of things. So. Yeah. Wildlife, sports, things like that. Yep. Yep. Super valuable. But it can help you on the macro side of the world, the close up side, too. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, is there anything available for close-up with cell phones, cameras? Yes. Yes, in fact, I just, when I went to Namibia, I bought this. You see that? 
And that has a little macro uh, lens on it that you clip onto your camera. So Doug, you're sharing your screen, so we can't see you. Oh. <laughs> we can only see what you're sharing. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's hilarious. I, uh, um, let me get let me let, let me get out of this just for a sec. So here, set of lenses, wide angle telephoto, and a little macro one. This is like one hundred and thirty dollars. I thought it was. I thought it did a really nice job, nice and sharp. So, so that's the answer to that is yes. Okay. Perfect. Back to focusing. So live view, an awesome functionality on your camera to be able to get it get in close and zoom in and make sure you're getting your focus precise um, it's a beautiful tool to use for focusing um, so use that just uh the only downside of live view um, is the battery um, usage so be mindful of that when you're when you're uh you're not active behind the camera and you're maybe doing something out in front to turn off live view while you're um you know, doing whatever besides um, focusing or your exposure or something like that, or depth of field. Um, but like I said, you can zoom in and get, um, you know, your focus really sharp. Um, another thing that's really helpful when you're under really high magnification um, is a focusing rail. And Oban makes a really great one. It's uh, compatible for all, all Arca Swiss plates. Um, and you have a uh, uh, multi-directionality to the focusing rail. You can go back and forth. You can go side to side. Um, and so for composition, and it's only $120. And it just mounts onto your camera or onto your tripod, just like your camera does. Um, and then you just mount your camera into that little plate, onto that little plate right there and, um, and go for it. So really valuable tool and not too expensive. Um, love the focusing rail. Just another pretty picture. The dead leaf. All right, so let's talk about close-up stability. We talked about the camera. We talked about the tripods. Talked about all the supplements. Um, and now, um, you know, close-up st stability. And a tripod is going to be your best friend when it comes to that. Um, certainly, cable release, like we mentioned at the beginning, a lens collar, like we also mentioned for, you know, getting things more stable on the tripod, your mirror, so making sure that your mirror's up if you're not in live view and you have a DSLR, um, use the mirror up feature on your camera before you take the picture, um, live view is uh, already, uh, the mirror's raised on a DSLR, so you don't have to worry about that and or focusing rail. So these are all ways to uh, get things more stable for your camera. The other thing that you have to worry about is getting your subject stable. And so a plamp um, is important, can be an important tool. And um, I own like three plamps and I'll show you what those look like. Windscreen, if you're working outside, um, certainly, you know, in a, a reflector or a diffuser, Disc diffuser help, you know, with the wind. S uh, string and stakes also can help. So I have that in my macro kit, and I'll show you that. A weather forecast, obviously, pretty important. And, uh, you know, compared to, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the time of day that you go out and shoot, what's what's the be your best option for getting the calmest wind, morning or evening? mornings right because the atmosphere is not heated up yet and so you're probably going to get less wind in the morning um all right so let's look at a couple of these things here's a here's a comparison between um a mirror up and one where the mirror is not up so uh the mirror up function on the on this camera is right there it just says m up but here's here's the difference this is activated on the left and the one on the right is not. And so you can see the slap of the mirror has created movement um, in just the camera. It's much sharper on the left one. So make sure you raise your mirror. Um, there's live, the live view button that raises the mirror. You have to get things more stable. A plamp, 
So these plants are awesome. Um, I think they're around $40. Um, and you can get ex uh, longer extensions to add on to the plant from the just the basic plant that you buy. But they have a little soft grip at the end. So that's for grabbing plants like shown in the in the example there. And then the clamp um, uh, attaches to your tripod or anything else you want to attach it to that's stable. Um, you can also use it to hold up discs. Um, there's two of them being used on the right there um, for a diffusion or a reflector or to block the wind. So those plants are awesome. There's the extension. Oh, $43. And the extension is, whoops, the extension I think is uh, about 12. So you're in, into it of about $55 for both of those things. But it's good to have more than one too. And then in terms of windscreens, you know, the diffusion or reflector discs are cheap. Velo is a good uh, company, um, Pro, uh, Proflex uh, for uh, the reflectors or diffusers. And they fold up small so you can put them in your pack. And there's just some four millimeter utility cord and some stakes um, so that you can make things, your subject more stable if it's a plant or something like that. Um, you can just stake it in and tie things off. So those are coming really helpful. So I always carry those when I'm out shooting outdoors things. Relatively cheap once again. Obviously a weather forecast can tell you a lot of information. That looks like a good morning right there in Missoula, Montana, with the wind being forecasted at one mile per hour. So that's uh, that's pretty good. And if you want to, if you want to talk about dew, um, you, the forecast can help you there as well. So uh, if you're uh, forecast for the next morning, the temperature and the dew point spread are equal, like it is here, 52 degrees, 52 degrees. That means that the air is, um, uh, the humidity is 100%. So everything starts to form dew. Um, so that can be really helpful if your forecast can give you both the low temperature and the dew point temperature um, can become uh, important to pay attention to that. If you want to go out and photograph dew, and who doesn't want to photograph dew? I don't know of anybody. So here's just a couple dewy shots. Little mayfly right there on the left. And obviously, if the low temperature and the dew point spread are below 32 degrees, you're going to get what? Frost. And frost is certainly fun to go out and shoot. Talked a lot about stability. Um, so then we're going to shift gears here a little bit and talk, talk about composition. And it's uh, 730. So before we switch gears, Let's just take a few minutes and get up and uh, move around a little bit. Um, so let's just take uh, five minutes and uh, grab something, something to drink, go to the bathroom and get, get your bones moving. How's that? that sounds like a good idea. Um, real quick, um, yeah. in, the in the chat, um, somebody asked the lens kit that you got for your cell phone. What brand was that? Uh, I got a Sigma macro lens. For the cell phone? Oh, oh, the kit for the cell phone. Yes. It's uh it's called A A P E X E L Apexel. Yes. Oh, and I was very impressed with the quality. All right. Okay. Everybody ready? Yeah, ready. Yes, we're we ready. All right. Just to we're gonna talk a little bit about composition because it's a, a composition because it's a way, hey, come on back here. Okay, there we are. Um, it's a little different um, with macro because normally you're going to compose in the camera, um, but, uh, you know, with, uh, or I mean, you can look around and then, um, and then decide you're going to pull out a lens and start shooting. In the macro world, you're going to actually compose while you're looking through the camera, which is completely different normally because you're not just looking around is that you're gonna start to, once you just see something, you're gonna put the camera on and start working the composition like that. And um, 
it's helpful to compose with the camera in uh, up to your eye because you're going to be um, getting really close to things. But it's also really important to have your tripod near you, carry it, uh, carry it, drag it with you like a little puppy dog because if you see something with your camera, you're down in a field of flowers and your tripod is 20 feet away and you go get the tripod, you're going to lose quite often that subject because it, it's, you know, too small and in a big world like that. So just drag your uh, tripod around with you um, so that you can just move it into position and start setting it up that way. And it's important in, uh, you know, macro, just like it is in, I guess, all photography is to subtract, you know, the things that are distracting and attract the things that are supportive. So you're going to explore in that way um, when you start to think about backgrounds and relative distances and how blurry things are and how sharp things are. And that all comes, that's where the patience comes in um, when you're composing in the macro world. Um, and you're going to, in terms of support, whether it's an attraction or a distraction, um, you're going to be thinking about shape, line, texture, color, tone, and idea, um, just like anything in terms of photography. So, um, so that uh, those are just some things to think about that surround your subject and support it or not. And if it doesn't support it, you get it out of there um, by lots of different uh, methods, like moving the camera or um, or moving the, the thing that's a distraction in the small world of macro, um, or does it support it and then you include it? And so I'm just gonna show you a few things that I thought were a distraction that the photographer just didn't pay attention to. Um, and it should have gotten it, gotten a different position on the subject um, or something else. And here's one of them. Um, certainly that red and white thing, because it's bright and it's red, um, very distracting. And so I would um, reposition the camera, you know, or put something back there so that it wasn't such a distraction. You can do all kinds of things to modify the background um, in the, in when you're shooting close up. Here's another little jewelry shot someone took and look at the green leaves in the back of the ground. They're not a distract or they are a distraction. The rest of the scene feels pretty good. But those few leaves just, uh, you know, pull your eye because they're so strong in terms of their shape and their color. Um, same thing here. Um, that brighter green is the most saturated thing in the shot. And so um, time to do something, time to switch positions, um, modify the background to get the distraction out of there. But here's a scene where the background is working because the the uh, branch that's out of focus supports the subject in all ways, shape, line, texture, um, not necessarily texture, I guess, shape, line, color, tone, um, and idea are all supported right there. Or bed springs here being supported by, you know, the other springs. So just be thinking about the secondary subject support. Like here, this leaf is being supported by the wood that's the bark that it's on. Um, so it's supporting it in um, texture and idea quite a bit and color for certain. Or here, just in terms of just the subtleness of the smallest thing in the background, those little tiny flowers that are present, but unsharp, they are supporting the other flowers in so many different ways, right? So that's something to consider when you're composing. Um, or here, the nice background on these mayflies, um, the sense that the sun is up there above the grass, and then the all it's just a homogenous background of green, um, just really, really nice. Or here, um, this little faucet um, handle with the, uh, the hose in the background and the hose going down. Um, supporting the idea of the, the, the knob. And here's just some examples where I just moved to change the background. You know, that's pretty good, but certainly I, could, I just moved a little bit and got a more uh, appealing and supportive background with this shot, same, but same moth, just by a little shift in camera position. 
or here with this leaf. That was my first attempt. And then I just moved it a little bit to get, um, you know, a little bit uh, more, uh, you know, supportive background. Or here with these small berries and just moved a little bit up to bring the background, a uh, darker background into the shop. Or here, first attempt, and their little distraction over on the left there. So I just moved a, just a fraction using my focusing rail. I just, all I had to do was twist the little gear and shifted it, shifted it a little bit to get a nice homogenous green background. So, and we'll talk about backgrounds when we talk about depth of field a little bit more. Um, but certainly I think that's something to just be conscious about when you're composing is take a look at the background almost second, right after you start to get your subject in in the in the plane um, of interest, then um, then just uh, start looking at the background immediately. And in terms of depth of field, depth of field is so critical when it, we're talking about close-up photography that um, you know, obviously you have to think about the relative distances of things in your shot. Like if you take a look at these two shots um, at F32 and at F2.8, um, certainly even at F32, the, the, there's parts of this flower um, that are not sharp, like the drops and the petal in the front. Um, and I, it's not, I'm not saying aesthetically this is bad. I'm just saying technically, if you wanted to get everything sharp, how would you change this? What would you do to basically get sharpness all the way throughout the, both the petals and the flower? Well, you would have to change the relative distance between those things. And so that means moving the camera um, to a different, a slightly different perspective. It might even be moving back and then trying to get, um, you know, moving the camera back and then cropping in later because you change the relative distance if you move the camera. Um, that would be another thing to do, to consider. But here's an, an example of the toothbrush I was doing for a class. And uh, the first picture um, I shot, I was like, well, I'd like to get a little bit more detail in the background, um, you know, just to give it more a little bit more depth because it's not a very interesting shot anyway. Um, but um, so all I did is move the glass basically and the toothbrush closer to the towel, which was the background. So I just literally moved the glass and moved it closer to the towel to get a little texture. And then I moved my camera back into position to get the same magnification ratio. So it's all about playing with these distances and relative distances between you, the subject, and the background. Um, and it might mean if it, this was a flower, it might be choosing a different flower that's closer to the background, something like that to give it a little bit more sharpness. So the relative distance is the relationship, the relative relationship between distances from camera to subject, the background. And here the top graphic shows you that the large R&D, excuse me, relative distance, the background is gonna be blurrier like the toothbrush. And then the bottom one is just a smaller relative distance so that the background would be sharper. And I just did that by moving the toothbrush and the glass closer to the background there. Um, or um, you could move the camera, right? So the plane of focus is on the blue subject there. And uh, you have a large relative distance up top, but by moving the camera backwards, you, you create a smaller relative distance. And so the background is going to become sharper. Or you could move the plane of focus to a different position. So like, for instance, if you're at an angle to say the, the front of a flower um, and you're not getting everything sharp, at say F32, you stop down and still things are unsharp. Well, you can move the camera so that things are in the the close and further subject distance are in the plane of focus. So another really just a thing to think about and some options you have to create what you want to get the sharpness where you want. 
And so here I did that with this rose. I unfortunately didn't take my first shot, but I was a little off to the left and pointing a little bit so that the left part of the flower was closer than the right. And so I couldn't get everything sharp at F32. So what I did is just move the camera so that the most of the flower was in the plane of focus and then stop down to F32 to get as much sharp as possible. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. And okay. um, yeah, somebody, somebody popped a question in the chat and the same thing was going through my mind. And although it may be your next slide, but um, do you ever use focus stacking when you're shooting macro? <laughs> um, that's so funny. Okay, well, there we go. <laughs> Carl, that's awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> Dan and I are psychics, I guess. <laughs> well, you know, I have I have attempted uh, focus stacking about three, well, three times, and I was using um, I was using uh, Photoshop to stack, and I was unsuccessful all three times using Photoshop. Um, and I know I know a lot of people, and I've talked to a lot of people about other softwares that are much easier to use. But it's still extremely difficult because it requires lots of work, computer work, to get everything sharp. Even with a with the company which is the most popular one, Helicon Soft Focus, um, it requires lots of work on the computer, and that's where I draw the line. So I don't focus stack personally. Um, and I would be interested on that if anybody uh, has any thoughts about that in in this in this group um, that could you know obviously counter my my distaste for focus stacking um, <laughs> and and maybe change my mind too. Um, does anybody have any any uh, any experience and good experiences focus stacking? Dan's Dan's the expert on it, but it's based on. Uh particular brand of camera. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I do have been doing it. Um, both. Uh, what happened, one of the reasons I got into Olympus in the first place, it, I have an, three different Olympuses and all of them can do it. And what happens, they actually have um, a focus acting built into the camera. So what happens is with certain, you have to have certain lenses to go with it, but with their macro lenses, it, it works. And with some of their non-macro lenses, it also works. And so what happens, it lets you set you know, you put it on the tripod and then you could click once and it takes a hundred shot up to a hundred shots, I think, um, moving the lens in certain increments every time. So you could even use it like shoot the lens at, you know, F2.8 wide open and just move it small enough increments. Um, you know, and obviously it has to be something that is standing still, you know, uh, so yeah, yeah. It's tricky, but, uh, it's that, it seems to be pretty good. And I, even on my little handheld Olympus, it's one of the reasons I got into them in the first place, because I started trying that with, I'd done handheld 10-shot uh, focus stacking in camera stuff, and they come out really well. It really does help increase the depth of field tremendously, you know, the, what the, you know, yeah, focus and so forth. So, Dan, that's great. I, lo I love that. And I, di I didn't even know that about Olympus, Olympus cameras, um, because it's never been brought up in a conversation with Olympus owner. Yeah. Um, so I think that's fantastic because I know the software trying to do it in Photoshop just never works. Yeah. yeah, that's a pain. I tried it before too. Which yeah, before. just a total pain. And I know Helicon can do a better job, but boy, it's complicated in that in that application because I've talked to a couple people about that as well. well, and well other, yeah, I found it complicated also because I tried it with Photoshop, but the thing that was even more complicated was that you still had to refocus and keep the camera steady. And, you know, because most most lenses you can't refocus automatically, you know, uh, at different times. So yeah. You'd have to do something to, you know, make it refocus so you get the shots to put together in the first place. Yeah. So, God, that's great to hear about the Olympus. What a what a cool, cool um technology in that camera, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very cool. I haven't gotten that good with using it on my big, my bigger Olympus yet because I, I have been too lazy to set up a tripod. I've done it a couple of times and it worked reasonably well. Um, and I want to try using it more. That's why I was asking if you'd done it. But anyway, God, that's great. Much. Great, Dan. That's thank you for that. Um, sure. And, you know, you guys, if you haven't heard of focus stacking, it just means that you take a series of pictures where you focus through your subject 
and then you merge them together. That's what it's all about. Um, and so you can expand the depth of field. You're not really expanding the depth of field. You're expanding what the depth of field would look like if you were to say have an F64 on your lens or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it can be really valuable for all kinds of things. It's just uh, it's just for me, I just don't want to spend the time on the computer like that. So now I'm going to have to buy an Olympus setup. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> I, I did want to mention that uh, the Nikon Z series have uh, the ability to take uh, focus stacking uh, in the there's a menu uh, setting for it. So it will take those, but it doesn't stack, stack them. them within the camera. You have to go then to something like Helicon or uh, uh, Photoshop to do that. Uh, and I've done it in Helicon, and uh, it, it actually does a pretty good job once you get over, you know, the, the different settings for it. And it allows you then to, to do some manual readjusting where the algorithms don't quite match. Yeah, so, right. Um, right. That's cool. You know, I, I was gonna also, I'll also add to Terry and, and Doug uh, that on the Olympus one, it'll do it both ways. It'll either you know, make a set of of pictures that you can uh, assemble yourself, or you can do the in camera part. And again, I'm, I'm I figure the camera knows how to do it better than I do, so I haven't tried it ever doing it uh, by moving, especially because I don't have Helicon or anything like that. Um, yeah, but it has both in it. Even their small little handheld cameras do have both in it. So, That's cool. You know, and and that technology will expand into the other brands too. I'm sure. Right. Um, so right. someday down the road, we won't be talking about, uh, you know, having to do it outside of the camera. It's all going to be done in camera. And that that's just so nice to hear that. And, um, you know, obviously, I didn't I didn't even know that. So that's cool. I love it. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. All right. We're going to shift gears again and just talk about modifying light. Um, and it's endless what you can do. So what what's important is to just think about what's important what you want the light to look like there's some limitations to that but not many and certainly if you're in the studio there's it's totally uh endless really but um so we we want to think about two of uh, the qualities of light being hard and soft uh one of the biggest things that describes your subject and when i think about hard light i think of these words to describe my subject dynamic, bold, exciting, uh, noticeable, loud is, is a good one. Because when you're using hard light you're, uh, and you have strong shadows and highlights, you, your eye movement is fast. It's, uh, it goes and jumps from highlight to highlight. And so that's why you can describe it as exciting, dynamic, bold, or loud, or things like that. Um, and you can modify hard light by using diffusion disks. An umbrella is a diffusion umbrella. Um, and certainly if you're outside, this can become important um, to use for the sun. Um, but certainly if indoors, you can um, put uh, diffusion umbrellas on, you know, light sources, um, on flashes, on studio lights, all those things to change the, the light from hard to soft. Um, and, you know, if you're using soft light, I find words to describe soft light as delicate and muted, um, unnoticed, subtle, quiet, um, because your eye movement is much more subtle because you don't have the strong highlights and shadows. Um, so, uh, so be thinking about that in terms of your subject and how you want it to be described um, with these kinds of words. Um, and so here's a uh, just a flower shot, in Colorado, and um, and the sun was out. And obviously, this is what one is. This is hard light because there's no diffusion, there's no cloud or diffusion disc. You know, being able to diffuse the light, and you can see that it's pretty exciting um, this light. But if you want to change that description to something, and I feel like this flower is kind of soft and delicate. Um, certainly, that this gives it some some energy, but uh, just a diffusion disc, and now it becomes much more delicate and quiet um, because of the change in light. 
So, and certainly we can do this because we're working such a small environment. Um, a cloud would also do this, but um, certainly you don't have to wait for a cloud because we're working in such a small space. So a diffusion disc works great. You could also diffuse the light by just holding up your jacket. It would put it into shade, so it's gonna be much bluer, um, but you'd still be diffusing the light um, because it would be coming from the reflection off of everything else around uh, around the subject. Here's, another, here's a tulip that I shot, a hard light, and used a diffuser just to soften the light there. Um, so it becomes a, a, a different thing. It becomes a, a different way to describe your subject. So be thinking about how you want to describe your subject and then start to play with the light. Um, here's a shot I just took of some pennies. And um, then I, you know, in the inside a studio light source and then um, put some diffusion on it. And um, now it becomes more interesting, I think, because of the light. This would, if you were selling stock, this would not be the, all that sellable, but this is highly sell, sellable um, because, and all it took was a diffuser in a studio setting. So the difference, uh, you know, just a little move, just a little thought that goes into how you might change things. Um, and this uh, little shot of this flower and the green background, I just uh, diffused the background with a reflector. And I sh and I threw or I I shaded the background and I threw in a little reflector to the inside of the flower um, to produce this. So it became a little brighter and the dark ground uh, background a little darker. So here's the difference between the two. That feels so much better to me um, because now the flower feels like it has more um, life to it. Um, and certainly you can use the uh, reflectors to uh, to give some direct directionality to the light um, and create a little harder light with a reflector because it becomes a smaller light source. So reflectors can be really valuable too. And if you buy a reflector, you don't need a really big one. Um, you need a smaller one because you're just reflecting light into somewhere. Um, and it's not it's not to your advantage to use a big giant reflector, especially in the macro world. Just get a smaller one and they're cheaper. So, you know, here's a little 22 inch that costs 25 bucks. Whereas a diffuser, you want a big diffuser um, because then you can also um, diffuse the background um, as well. So big diffuser, small reflector. And uh, so this set of flowers is, that's the umbrella. So I'm just diffusing the light with the umbrella and you're actually seeing the umbrella in the background there, a white umbrella, and it looks like a cloudy day. It looks all, like a, almost a rainy day because it uh, it's kind of gray, gray in the background. Uh, just be thinking about how you want to approach things when you look at your subject. Here's uh, some flowers in my basement and there's the window light is uh, bouncing off the table. So I used a, I used a polarizing filter to polarize the light off the table. And then I goboed the light from the window with just a piece of cardboard. So here's the three shots, three different interpretations of the same subject. So the one, first one is no, no uh, modifiers. The second one is just a polarizer. And the third one is polarized and then uh, gobo just means go between. So uh, putting a piece of cardboard um, to shade the, the light that's hitting the table um, is how I approach that third shot. So modifying the light, so many different kinds of ways. Um, just a matter of uh, giving it some thought. So here, uh, I you know, these are just uh, iris leaves. And... Uh, I just wanted the background to be darker, so I held a polarizer behind the uh, behind the opening to the leaves. So that's look. There's actually a filter behind those leaves. The polarizer just, you know, changing that situation, and it becomes a much more interesting shot, I think, than this. Just uh, adding a little little thought there to the background. 
And here, um, this is just window light. And so I added flash with a warm gel off to the left to indicate, uh, to brighten up the flower, to give it some direction too. So it indicates the light source in terms of it's coming from the left. So the window light is on the left and the flash is on the left with just a warm gel. And it becomes, I think, a, a much better shot because of the what the flash is doing, especially to that upper flower, right? And it's uh, actually illuminating the bottom or the, yeah, the one flower on the right too. So just kind of using tools to, to make things better. This is a light box. So those are pretty inexpensive. You can still find light boxes on eBay and they don't have to be big, but they're just such a great tool to use um, for all kinds of things when you're you're doing macro work. And um, this is a, just a daisy, or a, I can't even remember what flower it is, um, just lying on the light box and then shooting that right down at the flower. So that the light box is the only light source. And here, a little more dense flower. And so then I brought in a reflector, a warm reflector. Um, oh no, this is just a silver reflector and just reflected the light back into the daisies from the light box. So just to, you know, just be thinking about what the scene needs and modifying the light to accommodate it. Here, uh, just a cactus in my house playing around with the macro lens and uh, needed to add some light to the, the inside of that flower. So I used a little pen light flashlight just to add some light to the center of that flower. So much better than that. And here with my little pen light, the first time I saw this spider, um, and it looks, it was on my window, um, and it looks cool in silhouette, but, you know, I was like, oh, I grab a little pen light and light up that little spider. And so I did. And the, the uh, flashlight's just outside of the frame there um, and add a little side light to give it some depth to the spider. And that, it's funny, I was showing this uh, this, uh, this shot to a friend in M Missoula, and they were like, Doug, do you know what that kind of spider that is? And I'm like, no. And, um, and they said, that's a hobo spider. And hobo spiders are extremely poisonous. So I immediately went back to my window, and there was no hobo spider. It was somewhere else in my room. So I didn't sleep very well that night because <laughs> that spider was in my room somewhere. Um, these can be uh, cool little systems, especially if you're doing lots of macro work, um, just dual light systems. There's the Canon and the Nikon, but they're very pricey, between five and $800. And you can modify the ratio between the two lights in terms of brightness. So you can do all kinds of things. I've never bought these and I don't own them, but I've used them a couple of times and they really work well. It's uh, some pretty fancy little technology there um, for stuff that's right in front of the lens. So if you really get into it, maybe down the road, I want to pick up something like this. Here's Alexander Wilde does a lot of um, insect work and he uses these lights all the time. Um, here's a praying mantis. It's all lit up with the dual light system. Um, pretty cool shot. Um, here's another one of Alexander Wilde's shots using that same setup. So pretty cool. It looks like it's on a mirror, right, too? Um, but this is a really beautiful shot using double exposure. Um, here's, a, here's another... Uh, combination shot. This is a technique you can do with with uh, with two shots. We used to do with this with slide film and then merge the two slides, but one of them you take sharp and then one of them you throw out of focus for the second shot and it becomes kind of a glowy, glowy kind of thing, um, gives it a little bit different look. So that's using focus as, as the double exposure. Here's Charles Needle. Needle. He's, he's pretty famous for multiple exposures. That's not a macro shot, but um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I get that uh, too much. That becomes a little more complicated for my taste. Just flower shots. 
that's uh, spinning the lens while the while he's shooting. I'm not sure I like that all that much either, but different technique. Here's a fun technique. You put rain X on a piece of glass um, that's supported above your subject. And in this case, it's pencils. And then uh, you add, you spray on the water and the rain X uh, causes it to beat up like on your car going through a car wash. And um, you get this uh, reflection um, through the drop um, of water. So that's kind of a neat technique. And then you have your dew. That's beautiful. One thing that I played around with that became a whole gallery show was uh, shooting the insides of flowers um, with a motion blur. So putting on a macro lens and a couple of the extensions to get like to two to one and then going inside of flowers and just moving the camera with a longer exposure. That was, uh, and that's something you can do when you're tired of being so technical and tedious with the normal macro process. Um, just go in and, and play a little bit with, um, you know, a different technique like motion blur. So here's just a few of those. I don't even know what kind of flowers those are. It's been a while, but just a blur of color. And you don't need a tripod. Just go in there handheld, do a little, little camera movement inside the flower and come out with some pretty cool stuff. That's an iris, I know. I remember that one. Don't know what flower that is either. Another technique that's really cool, a workshop student told me, and it uh, taught me, and it's called focusing with your toes. And you, so you, here's the setup. You, you uh, shoot wide open with your aperture so that you basically have a really minimal depth of field range, but you can shoot fast. So on a bright sunny day, um, you know, your sh shutter speeds are 500th of a second, a thousandth of a second, 250. Um, and then you basically focus as close as you can so that you don't have to worry about focusing again. So say you have a macro lens, you go to one to one and then you you're handheld so you don't use a tripod and then you just lie down in a field of uh, field of flowers or grasses or whatever. And then just start moving your camera through the subject, through the grasses, through the flowers until you see something sharp that looks really cool. And then you just on continuous shooting mode, just go drrr, and then you can try it again and try it again. And one or two of those shots is going to be sharp where you want it to be. And um, and the rest is going to be blurry. And it's just a really fun technique when you're tired of, you know, like I said, the tedious uh, world of macro. Um, it becomes kind of uh, macro light, but really fun to do. Um, and so here's a series of shots I took focusing with my toes. And the reason she calls it focusing with your toes is because your elbows are the support for your camera. You're on your stomach. And then when you push you with your toes, you actually move your body forward and you move through a subject like grasses or whatever it might be. So that's what I did on all these shots um, that you see here is I just focused with my toes, so to speak. Um, and it's just a really fun thing to do because you never know what you're going to get and um, you never know what you're going to find. Um, it's just fun. So that's focusing with my toes through a big dandelion. Just pressing, pressing right through it. Doesn't matter whether things hit the front of your lens or not, um, unless they block your subject, obviously. So that's why you're, it just takes a little practice. This is just in some normal blades of grass. Some uh, foxtail barley through the underside of a fern. I was lying on my back. Focusing with my butt, so to speak. Fun techniques. And a little drop of water that I found on a dewy day. How cool. So that was just, just some fun techniques to try and play with with your macro equipment.
um, that's not so hard as, uh, you know, time consuming as getting the tripod out and all of that. Um, and we'll wrap this up with a quote from Elliot Porter, because I, he's, he never shot macro. I don't think he never published anything. But I think it's true for the macro world that a detail is quite capable, like a macro shot, of eliciting a greater sense of intensity and emotion than the whole scene evoked in the first place. Because the whole of nature is too vast and too complex to grasp quickly, but a fragment is comprehensible and allows the viewer uh, to uh, allows the imagination to fill in the excluded setting. I love that. Um, and I think that's definitely true for the macro world. Um, is there any questions or comments? Any Anything pop up that you didn't ask while the presentation was happening? Did we get them all in? I have a question to talk about um, vibration. Yeah. About what? A question about vibration reduction, whether you, you know, many modern cameras have it both in the camera and in the lip, sometimes in the lens. Is it advantageous to have vibration reduction on for um, creating stability? Or Only not? if you're having a problem, like if there was wind, that's a great question. If there was a little bit of wind and you could tell, but just by looking through live view that the wind was causing the little, the little movement uh, on your, your camera, um, then yeah, I would use it. Um, but I would not use it if you're if you're if you know that you have pretty much everything is stable and there's there's not movement when you look through the look through the camera or look in live view because the uh, the vibration re reduction is going to actually move the camera a little bit um, if everything is stable. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. All right. And, and the only thing that I wanted to say is is just a, a comment. You you know, you're talking about lighting and the flash systems that the Canon and the Nikon have and and that kind of thing, and that you really don't use that stuff that much. But uh when I've whenever I've done macro, I really haven't done that. I've used a a flash on a cord or something like that, you know, have additional lighting off to the side or whatever. But but the only point I wanted to bring up is going back to uh lens focal lengths. You know, obviously, if you've got a longer focal length macro lens, that gives you the opportunity to get those lighting elements, to get that reflector and those kind of things into your subject and use those tools. God, that's a great point, Carl. Great point. Another reason to, to consider when you're buying a macro lens is, yeah, get the longer. And I really, when I go to shoot macro, I normally am using my 200 millimeter macro just for all those reasons, because the distance uh, you just get too close with a 50 or 60. And that's a great point um, about lighting, too, is that, yeah, you need some room to move around. Um, and that gives you that freedom to do that. So that's a great point, Carl. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Anybody else? Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> no, one other thing, uh, I was going to put this in chat. Uh, one of the things I got, and this is like a pretty cheap thing, It's this is a reference to it on B&H. And what it is, it's a ring light that's, it's not a brand specific one. It's like 70 bucks and it uses, it can flash, but it also uses LEDs and you can just turn them on. And so one of the things I've found is that on the limited amount of macro I have done, um, if you have this ring light, you can put it, you know, it, it, it'll attach to your lens very, you can get various different step down or step up rings or whatever you need. It uh -huh. comes with some of them, but it fits around your lens. And then you can turn on the LED. I never, with using it as a flash, I haven't had very much luck, but using it as, with, by just turning on the LEDs, it's worked phenomenally well because not only that, you can adjust the light temperature and you can adjust the amount of light and see what's happening before you fire your shot. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I posted the, the link to it on uh, the chat in case anybody's interested. So. Yeah. Anyway. That's a great, great thing, Dan. Uh, so I use my Luxly, my light panel, uh, little Luxly um, yeah. for a lot of macro work. Right. And that's that exactly the same thing. You can adjust the light perfectly to the temperature and the strength that you want. And it's just beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that if whatever I use flash, it's either over or under, you know, I, I sit there and screw around with it more than anything, trying to get it to be exactly right. Yeah. Um, and usually it's too powerful. I usually, you know, 
wash out everything. So at any rate, this thing seemed to have been a good answer for that. Oh, I think it's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, uh, yeah, I guess I'm, pre I'm pretty uh, fluid with my flash because I use it a lot. So, um, but still I use the, the Luxly more now than I ever, ever used the flash in, in studio. Um, and even outdoors, I'll use that Luxly too. Um, you know, so it can be mounted on a little tripod if I don't want to handhold it too. So, um, Awesome. And I assume that's, that's just a little uh, battery powered LED panel kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I, I don't have it here. I could uh, bring it out, but I don't have it with me right here. So, um, but anyway, awesome discussions. That's great. Anybody else? All right. Well, you guys, I really appreciate it. I totally appreciate your time and I'm glad you were here and I hope. Hope people got something out of it, no matter how experienced you are. But, um, you know, I'm just uh, glad that you guys all settled on the macro because I haven't spoken about that for uh, quite some time. Great. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you Doug. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I just want to well, say you very yeah. much. it was great. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I just want to say the thing that I do. And so this is a little marketing for my business is uh, I do workshops. I also teach for Rocky Mountain still. I've been with them for 30 years now. Man, it seems like um, it's not that long. But uh, my workshop's coming up. I have one left that's not sold out this year, and that's Big Bend. Um, and that's close to selling out. And if you want to go to Big Bend in October, I have that. Um, and then Where next year, what's that? Where are you located? I, I'm in Missoula. Okay. But, but anyways, yeah, so um, location workshops, you know, is, is what I do. Um, and so this one is, is in Big Bend, going to do the Columbia River Gorge in April of next year, um, going to Mount Rainier um, in July for the flowers and the mountain. So that's going to be exciting. I always love that place. Um, going to Glacier National Park going to do uh, a thing called Ancient Landscapes in uh, Cedar Mesa and Monument Valley. Um, that's in August and September. There's going to be two, two of those. Um, that's going to be a really fun workshop. The Coast of Maine and Acadia in October. And I have a historic Montana in black and white. So that's learning uh, processing um, in uh, Lightroom and Silver Effects. And that's going to all the best uh, ghost towns and uh, homesteads in Montana. Uh, so that's really fun. Going to Death Valley in uh, October and November of next year. And uh, one trip to Cuba in December. And so that's my workshop schedule for next year. Can't wait. I love it. And so... Can you get into Cuba there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I've been a few times to Cuba over the last few years, um, so love that one. But uh, anyway, if you ever decide to sign up for any online class, I, I usually do a lot of online classes too, and those will be scheduled fairly soon. Um, but if you ever need it, want a little discount to entice you, just use Cam Club 2023, um, and that might change to 2024 next year, but if you want a little, little incentive there. Um, you can do that. So that's it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, absolutely, you guys. That was a really fun evening. It was. Uh, it's. It. It got me excited just to go out and shoot a little macro, which I haven't done, um, just because it hasn't been that great of weather in Missoula. Um, but now uh, the flowers are just starting to come out, and um, and I can't wait to after this class to pull out my macro gear and and um, get a couple shots. So thanks, you guys. Thank and, you don't so forget, and don't forget, you have to run over to B&H and buy an Olympus, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Dan uh, hey, if you have my uh, email address, would you, you you send me a couple of shots just over email? If you have them? Uh, sure, I will. Yeah, my email, is, my email is dougjohnsonphoto at gmail. Okay, okay. Good if you have the work. time and you feel like it, I, I'd love to see it. Sure, I will. Yeah. Cool. Thank you.
Awesome. All right, you guys. Well, thanks for everything. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for educating us on the, the world of macro. And I hope that during the rest of the year that we'll see some uh, of our members' macro photos and competitions. Yeah. And uh, Carl, if you guys ever need someone to do a critique, a guest critique, uh, just strictly a critique, I would love to be a part of that um, because I think it's such a valuable tool for all things photography to um, to just hear a critique. So if you ever want to do something um, besides contests, um, just give me a call and I'll, I'll we'll do a critique. We need a judge that likes little things like insects, like landscapes. Hey, well, I'm not a I'm not a good judge, um, but I am a good critiquer. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to ask to clarify that. So so you're not you're not looking to be a competition judge, but if we had um, a session where people submitted photos and were looking for critiques, you would do something like that. I would do it. Yep. Awesome. I really okay. think it's a huge, huge, yeah. valuable educational tool to listen to a critique. Exactly. I do, too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I thank you, sir. You and, bet, uh, Carl. I, I thank will definitely keep that in mind. Awesome. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, David, for your help. All things. All right. And, and thank you, you guys, everyone. You guys take care. Right. Thank you again. Bye -bye. Thank you to everybody who attended. Good night. Yes. Bye. All right. Ciao.